Okay, so yeah, hello. Uh, my name's Marie. Um, I'm the digital designer for Wilson Cook. Um, and as Louise explained today, Andy and I will be briefly outlining the different design systems, um, how we use them and why. Um, so the main systems we use on a daily basis are these ones listed here. Um, so we have the pieces of software from the Adobe suite, uh, such as Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Premiere Pro and After Effects. Um, and we also use Compose Contact Emailer, uh, which is what we use to build our emails. And then finally, we use WordPress to build websites. Um, so Andy and I will briefly introduce each of these systems and explain how and why we use these. Um, so to start off, how and I suppose why we use WordPress to build websites for our customers. Um, so some of you are, may already be familiar with, with WordPress, um, especially considering that WordPress now powers nearly a third of the world's websites. Um, and it's very, various unique features are what makes it the most popular uh, content management system used today. So to start off, um, WordPress is user friendly, um, even for beginners. Um, I'm actually self-taught. I taught myself WordPress, um, you know, many years ago. Um, so a WordPress site is very intuitive, um, has a very intuitive admin dashboard um, that makes it really easy to navigate around. Um, this is great for our customers because once we have a, we've built them a site, uh, we can hand over the login details and then they can easily log into the back end, make any uh, amendments to copy, make minor tweaks here and there um, as and when they need to. Um, WordPress is very SEO friendly. Um, SEO, uh, which I'm, I'm sure most of you know, uh, stands for search engine optimization. Um, and as we all know, searchability is key to ranking high on Google and other search engines. Um, the code behind WordPress is very clean and simple, making it easy for search engines to read and index, index the site's content. Um, in addition, each page, post, and image can have its own meta tag, um, keywords, description, title, um, and can be optimized with specific keywords, um, allowing for very precise search and engine optimization. Um, you can also use tags to further enhance your search engine optimization, and WordPress includes a variety of tools. Um, and plugins as well that you can install for, for further optimization. Um, so to elaborate on the plugins I mentioned earlier, um, WordPress includes all of the elements needed to create a basic site, uh, but many users want some more specialized functions uh, related to a site specific needs. Um, the WordPress plugin directory includes hundreds of plugins, um, which are all free, um, but there are thousands available that you can purchase too. Um, plugins are basically small pieces of code um, that are designed designed to perform specific tasks, um, which basically you plug into the site. Um, so we, this allows users to add features such as shopping carts, galleries, contact forms, that kind of thing, um, to any compatible WordPress site. And these plugins can be activated or deactivated and uninstalled as, as needed as the site evolves. Um, so on to the next bullet point. Uh, WordPress is super easy to customize. Um, there are thousands of WordPress themes available to install to a site. Themes offer users an array of choices for fine tuning the appearance and functions of a new site. Uh, many of these are instantly available to a new site owner through the WordPress theme directory, and they're completely free. Um, however, there are thousands more which you can you can purchase through the design marketplace and third party designers from around the world too. Uh, so moving on to the next point. It's easy to see how WordPress can be used to create a wide variety of websites. Um, there's a perfect WordPress theme for just about every kind of website, uh, whether it's a blog, business site, online store, that kind of thing. Um, that coupled with the thousands of plugins available as well mean, really means you can fine tune the appearance and the functions of your site. So next is a basic slide um, to show the back end and the front end of one of our re recent WordPress sites. Um, I could elaborate further on WordPress, uh, but we'd be here all day, especially the way I ramble on. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. So moving on to Photoshop and how we use it. So Adobe Photoshop is an imaging and graphic design software used by thousands of people in many different roles across the world. Uh, not only is it used for image editing, but you can use Photoshop for retouching photographs, creating image compositions, um, and even for designing websites too. So for instance, you can design the look of a site in Photoshop, uh, export it as a JPEG, send the JPEG to a customer for approval, and then move on to building the site in, in WordPress or whatever content management system you decide to use. Uh, so it saves time in the long run. Um, Photoshop tends to be used for online graphics rather than for print. 
Um, this is because it creates graphics using pixels uh, rather than vectors, which I'll elaborate on in a bit more detail further on. Um, I tend to use Photoshop myself for all of the points listed here. Um, so for instance, if if I wanted to use um, it to create an infographic, I'd use Photoshop for that. Any social media adverts, um, any graphics to be used in an email, um, or if I want to create an image for a website, I've built as well. So, oh, I'm going a bit too far ahead there. So yeah, uh, this is just again a basic slide showing on the right the different layers of a Photoshop file, uh, which when combined create this image composition um, for an advert for some car cleaning products. So onto Illustrator. So Illustrator is mainly used for creating graphics that will go to print um, as it uses vector graphics instead of pixels, which is what Photoshop uses. Um, vector graphics are points, lines, curves, and shapes that are based on mathematical formulas rather than pixels which means the artwork is always clean, it's always sharp, um, and it can be scaled infinitely without losing any um, quality. Hence why we use this for when we create the logos, single print, printed documents such as business card or PDFs, um, and we would use Illustrator to create icons as well. So if you can imagine a business wanted to have their logo printed onto a T-shirt, onto a van, onto a, even a billboard, uh, you'd need that file to be a vector file so it can be blown up to whatever size it needs to be um, and not look rough and blurred around the edges. So if I move on to this next slide, you can see the difference between um, a bitmap or pixelated file and, and a vector file as well. Okay, so now I'll hand you over to Andy. Um, he'll go on to explain um, how and why we use the other systems that we, we listed earlier. So over to you, Andy. Nice one, thanks Marie. So I'm Andy Ackroyd, uh, Senior Designer at Wilson Cook. I'm going to take you through the remaining programs, which is InDesign, After Effects, Premiere Pro, and our mailing system. So I'll start with InDesign first, which is leads on from Marie's Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator files. Program, sorry. Um, so InDesign, it's very similar to Illustrator, to be honest. There's always uh, this sort of toss up between whether you use Illustrator or InDesign. Some designers will use one when it should be the other, but we'll see. InDesign normally focuses on the sort of the big production print like products such as like, booklets and leaflets that are like multi-page. It's all about scale really. Um, you know, Illustrator would be good for one or two pages, but then after that it starts becoming quite like a, a much bigger behemoth and you've got like InDesign to sort of take over from that point. Uh, InDesign is really cool as well because you can sort of place files from Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop in it as well, which means that you know you can do your photo manipulation in Photoshop, drop a big image into InDesign for your big photo page. You can also do some intricate design work on a logo in Illustrator and then place that into InDesign. So it's all about using the right program and then like embedding them within the next one, which keeps you know the main thing is trying to keep everything organized in a file like this, especially. If you're working on say like a hundred page booklet or something you you, you just need that organization otherwise it can start to slip so yeah so in design print production big documents like brochures booklets leaflets repeat elements so you've got um like page numbering and things like that things that you need to be consistent in the same place so like say if you've got a logo in the corner of a booklet it needs to be there on every page you can create master pages like similar to you can in powerpoint so you could have like, say the Wilson Cook logo at the bottom, you know, the bottom left, what have you. And that can run throughout the entire document. And if you want to change it, you know, on the one master page, it will change it on every other page, which is quite cool. Um, same for like backgrounds and things like that. If you want to change the background of the entire document, it could be like two clicks. But also in InDesign, like I mentioned, you've got linked files. So rather than doing everything within InDesign, trying to design within InDesign, because it's actually quite difficult to design in, you know, to create something new within InDesign, you create it in Photoshop or Illustrator and then place it into InDesign. InDesign also is very, it's, it's made for things like brochures and booklets, which means alignments and margins are quite important. Having everything aligned to you know, a specific like margin or padding is quite important to keep the consistency throughout a booklet. You don't want uh, titles and text you know, moving about as you're flicking through a booklet. You want everything to be regimented in some way and keep some sort of design philosophy throughout the layout. Can you go to the next page, Marie? So this is just a little look. Uh, it's, qu it's quite difficult to see, probably, if you've got a small screen. But on the left, you can see the sort of the workflow and how we see it. And the right is like the output. On the left, you've got all the margins and all the alignments. And basically, in InDesign, as a general 
F. So a rule of thumb is everything should be aligned to something else or at least something else on the page or whatever you're looking at to keep the sort of balance and the consistency. Um, and as you can see there, there's, there's quite a lot going on. Uh, the blue lines represent margins and the purple lines represent the page borders. So, and then if you look on the right, you can see how everything has been, it just falls into place and feels like it has the right balance and the consistency. And then if we're in InDesign and we make a new page, you know, all those margins and, and borders are still there so you can work to it and keep that consistency throughout, say a hundred page document and never lose, you know, your, your placement, your logo, or lose your placement of your, of your main title, which is, which is key really in, in a big document. And the next slide, Marine. So this is, this is one of the panels within InDesign. It's, it's, it's quite simple. It's basically, um, the same, I think it's Word or PowerPoint. You've got like a sort of section on the left um, and it's, you can dra and drag and drop entire sections of what you're working on and just move them around. It's quite simple. So if you started out uh, with your intro page, which is a single page, and you start into double page spreads, after that, so pages four and five, so it's some content that you want to move to, towards the end of the booklet. It's literally a drag and drop. You know, you don't have to take every page and move it on one. It's quite, it's quite intuitive that it, it's, it's basically drag and drop, which I think is quite an important tool in if you're doing a brochure, like I say, for 100 pages. So yeah, InDesign is pretty much uh, the tool you go to when you're making large scale files, really. And on the next slide, I've just got sort of a little overview of all three and how they work together. So on the left, as Marie mentioned, we've got Photoshop, which is your photo-based imagery, you know, yeah, the actual composition of photos or elements together that you need to uh, use pixel-based tools to merge or overlap and things like that and add shadows and things like that. Um, it's used a lot in web graphics for small small little graphics as well because there's some tools in Photoshop for easy output to web. Um, there is a little bit of an overlap in Illustrator, but it tends to be for small little web bars Photoshop's the go-to. Uh, things like mock-ups and renders for Photoshop. So you don't really want to be doing a mock-up or a render. So like if you design some, you know, like you know, a box for packaging, and you want to sit it in a scene with a nice shadow, you won't do that in Illustrator. It'd be, it'd be too difficult. You'd want to do that in something like Photoshop. And then moving on to Illustrator, that's where you start to do your logos and your il literal illustration. Um, so a lot of Illustrators will use, well, some will use Procreate, but a lot of them, if they're using the Adobe Suite, will use Illustrator to actually draw. It's got brush tools and things like that. And because of the way it's vector-based, you know, they can draw a brush tool and then scale it massively. Um, there's also icons that you would draw in Illustrator because you've got a lot of tools that, that are based on things like rounding corners and, and basically just a lot of tools to make really finely tuned uh, graphics and shapes basically. You wouldn't want to do that in Photoshop, it'd be too difficult. And then moving over again into InDesign, which is the last one, which is the putting everything together into your massive documents and, and just large scale. Yeah, I think that's enough for those three. So we'll move on now to our email system, Compose Contact. So for our clients, we do a lot of campaign work um, and a lot of campaign work comes down to socials and emailers. And emailers is a big component, so big it has its own little system that we use that's um, it's quite intuitive really in that when we open Compose Contact on our side, we've got, you know, we can see the database of all our clients and then all our clients mailers and, and the things they're actually going to send. So I'll just work through its traits. It's got quite a lot of personalization for the mailers. You can literally start with a completely blank canvas, drop in all your designs, your text, and away you go, um, which is obviously brilliant if you're a designer because you want to have as much control as possible. There's a lot of um, mailing systems which are very regimented and you can't really change that much, but it's quite a, a fluid system in that as long as you know the tools uh, that you're at your disposal, you can work with it. You know, you can design images to work with how this system works and get everything just how you want it. There's also a couple of other areas that me and Marie will look at, which is once we've designed it, we want to preview how it looks and test it. So this means yeah, it's like sends ourselves an email and we can see how it looks before it goes out. Uh, it also creates like an automated mobile version, which we can then check over and see if that works just as well. So these two aspects are quite important. You know, the last thing you want to send is a, an email out that's a bit wrong or doesn't quite display properly. So those two are quite important. 
And the final thing is after you've sent your, your mailer out in this system, you want to see the insights into it and our analysis. So we've got uh, some other colleagues that would look at these insights and analysis, you know, and feedback to the client, or would use this feedback to improve our next mailers to the actual targeted customers within the system. There's a few more techie bits inside there as well, like um, different lists of who we're targeting, uh, things like that, which mean we don't get involved with specifically, but our colleagues who are into that kind of thing, you know, uh, breaking down lists of, you know, different targets from how we've signed up uh, potential customers for our clients. So just go back to the design now on the next page. So for mailers uh, specifically, we probably use uh, Illustrator because it's a one page document. You know, we don't need multiple pages. We actually need to design it, quite a lot of creativity in it. So we need to keep it in that system. Uh, we'll use Photoshop sometimes to manipulate photos and then drop in. So there's some uh, imagery in there as well uh, that we'd, uh, for example, on the very left one, top left, you've got this sort of like cross section of two images, which is like a, a render and then the final product. And in that specific one, it was to show how we can go from designing um, a kitchen in this system instance and to how it would look in the end result. So that would be done in Photoshop, so quite a lot of photo manipulation going on there and then placed into Illustrator. So the actual designs, how it works as a process. Um, so we start with like a campaign idea uh, worked on by the team. This could be like a top level campaign idea for our client or it could be a very specific uh, campaign, like a um, very targeted towards a specific customer base. Uh, then we'll work with uh, content writers at Wilson Cook uh, on our team, which will try and write some really engaging content based on that campaign idea or that brief. Um, and that will feed back to us as designers. So then we take that content uh, and, and the general idea of the theme and come up with like a visual based idea of what it should look like. Um, uh, we also use like existing brand assets as well. That's quite important. So we don't just want to design something completely fresh. It's based on like existing brand architecture. So on this example of multi-wood, we've got the multi-wood logo and their sort of color scheme. It's quite premium, it's quite um, minimal. So we'll keep that in mind. We don't just want to go wild with it. So using the campaign combined with the brand assets to create these three examples here, they're all different mailers targeted towards different aspects. Uh, it's also important with things like mailers and socials to keep it engaging uh, and keep things like call to actions quite prominent throughout. So the idea is that this mailer comes out and we really want people to click certain aspects of it or even use the top navigation as if they were on the website and go to certain parts of the website that they want to visit. So they might get this email there, they'll see, you know, we was talking about these fancy new kitchens and then there'll, there'll be like a call to action about, you know, check, check out this design or at the top, they might see a link for, you know, a list of uh, kitchens they can look at and they might just think, oh, I'll just quickly browse that. And then that's a success then we've, got people to successfully, you know, go to the website through our mailers, really. Uh, and like I mentioned before, once we do all this, it's quite smart in that it creates a mobile version. So we don't have to go in and manually create a mobile version of each mailer, which would be quite tricky. And um, you just got to think beforehand how we make it and how you kind of got to learn how the system works and where it makes decisions for you based on how it converts it from sort of um, a web view desktop version to the mobile view just keep that in mind as long as once you get used to it it's quite easy to work with it and then it automatically generates the mobile version nearly every time um, how you want it really and then on the next slide we've got sort of this is our sort of uh, behind the scenes look at our system so this is the same client so if you were looking at um here is is what is this this is what me and see as the designers it's got like different templates uh, that we can create. And you can see a bunch of different ones there. So what it is basically is we go and create a template, uh, design it, do whatever we wanna do. Um, and then we can pass it on to our other team members who will create like the subject lines and, and make sure all the links go to the right places and things like that. And make sure it's targeted to the right lists that we've um, that we've got on the system, you know, the right client lists, whether it's um, a trade or, uh, B2C or anything like that, just make sure it's targeted properly. It also allows us in this system to duplicate um, mailers. So for example, if we create a mailer and then we need to retarget it to a different uh, selection of uh, just a different list from the client, 
we can open it up, change the elements that we need to, you know, maybe retarget it, to reword it slightly, and then retarget it towards a new list, which is quite important for workflow. And the next one, right? So this is our, once we actually click into the template, um, this is what we see basically. And um, there's a lot of different areas within this little design suite. Um, but it's mainly, it's mainly drag and drop. So we create our InDesign files and then we split it out to different sections without, you know, without the text. We drop our images in and we put our text in and color it up, uh, drop our links in. Uh, the design phase is mainly in Illustrator, still within our own systems. And then the actual design on the system is quite minimal. It's um, just changing things like fonts and, and colors and links and things like that. So yeah, that's our mainly, mainly system as a, a bit of an overview. Uh, and now finish off with the last one, which is how we use After Effects and Premiere Pro. So this is motion-based uh, design. So a lot of, um, to be honest, a lot of things on the internet now are motion-based. Nearly uh, most of the adverts I see are engaged with uh, motion in some way, even if it's very minimal, uh, whether it's just like, you know, it looks like a still advert, but part of it's moving, or the whole thing is basically video. So. Premiere Pro and After Effects is motion effects, uh, compositions, which is like um, making things work together in a little uh, little system within a system. So, for example, if you're making a motion video and you've got an intro logo, you will design that logo as its own little file. Um, and then you can keep everything organized, basically, because if you try and animate an entire video as one, it can be quickly become uh, overwhelming. So it's almost like creating folders, compositions. So creating folders within After Effects, and that allows us to create things like, say, an animated logo. And then if we work on another project, we can take the animated logo and literally move it from one file to another without having to animate it again from scratch, which is very like that saves a lot of time to be honest, and it's quite uh, effective in its use. There's also visual effects you can do in After Effects in Premiere Pro. So things like you can't really do in a in a still shot, so like glistens, um, obviously any 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 um, movement things like bounces or just fades and things like that. You can't really do in still animation or get the effect of. There's also tracking as well, which is basically creating like uh, movement through like uh, paths. So you create some text, and then you want that text to move across the screen. You can create like a track for it to run on and things like that. It's quite smart. And then the last one is animation. It's you can do there's various forms of animation, but you've got things like um, like puppet movements. So if you were creating like a character walking down the street, you could literally put like, if you imagine putting pins in a doll and then moving those those elements around, you can create like the effect of a person walking and things like that. So it's quite it's a very robust robust system, and it's uh, it's quite actually difficult to use, especially uh, After Effects because there's so many options, and just adding that whole other axis of things being able to move on top of um, your visual based uh, sort of 2D flat is is like a whole other level. It's so quite tricky, but it's also quite fun. Uh, so just moving on to the next bit, Marie. Um, it's got a couple of examples here. So on the left is like, um, this, this is on one campaign, but on the left you've got their sort of still images, which will be on say social media, you know, your Facebook, your Instagram. Um, and for this campaign, I thought it would be, it's quite important that um, what we're trying to show tells a story, and it's it's it was a lot better to tell this story as a visual um, as a visual piece, just because of the way it works. I don't know if you can press play. You should be able to press play on there, Marie, Marie and it, it's um, it will show you that it might be a bit slow on your screens, but you can kind of see how it, it flows together. And it's about designing your dream kitchen in different places and being able to do it anywhere. So this sort of flow, this quick flow, this quick story that you can tell has, I think, in my opinion, a lot more engagement and a lot more impact than, say, a still image. So it's, it's, it, it's always, it always depends on what your actual content is. But um, I think sometimes uh, video or motion video uh, can tell a longer story in a short time and it can be more eye-catching, especially you know, in today's sort of short attention span based world where most people spend their time scrolling, and if you just see something moving, or you just see something doing something interesting other than being completely stationary, it can be quite interesting um, way to you know grab people's attentions. And because it's motion-based, and you don't need to use every single bit of space on the design, 
you can use a lot of white space as well. So you can just literally have, say, like a blank canvas and just put hello in the middle. And that's a lot more eye catching than most of the say, adverts or pieces of content at the moment, which try and sort of bombard you with lots of information at the same time. So video is a good way to keep it quite minimal and just then you can move on to the next sort of um, part of the story. So you've got hello and you could move on to the next bit, which is you know imagery based or whatever your content is. We're about to move on to the next slide, Mary. Cheers. So this is just a little look inside After Effects. As you can see, it looks very complicated. Um, it's basically, everything is the same in terms of how you would think uh, a design program works in terms of it looking like Photoshop or Illustrator. We've also got the additional version of a timeline and the timeline is the thing across the bottom, bottom and that's how you basically visually um, see how the story progresses and how the how this animation progresses from left to right uh, like a sort of seconds and minutes timeline and that's how you build the file really which is quite interesting and um, you got on the, for example on the file if you've got all your files you want to use in the bottom left is your, your layering from top to bottom things that come uh, visually in front of everything and things that come visually at the bottom on the right of the timeline is actually um, it, it displays in that order as well, so you can you can overlap elements and have things behind things and appearing in front of things, which is important in animation, having that sort of uh, layering. Yeah, it's quite it's quite um, a robust system. And then if you go to the next slide, Marie, just something I was looking at um, before presenting this was actually using video uh, to boost engagement. So I've read a lot of studies about uh, still image versus uh, video or animation um, apparently it's roughly even between um, impressions and clicks but for actual engagement for getting people involved uh, like comments and, and just engaging with the media overall it was saying that sort of video and visually um, it, it, it stops you in your tracks almost so you're scrolling down and you'll see something moving and your eye automatically wants to see what it is if it's especially if it's moving uh, in a way that um, Sort of engages you if the in initial video isn't completely still um, and, it, and, and it actually pops out so yeah it's, it's, it's it can stop someone in the tracks and then you can tell a quick story you know a lot of um, adverts now are getting even shorter and shorter and a lot of adverts try and tell an entire story in the first five seconds these days because that's um, if they if they convert an animation or a video to an advert you've only got like five seconds normally before you, people can skip ads these days so on things like YouTube so just try and capture that initial, you know, the, the customer's imagination very quickly. And if you can do that with imagery or video, that's that's a win. But I think I think video normally wins because you can tell a better story in a shorter time. And yeah, I think that's it for, for After Effects and presentation as a whole. Yeah, that's it. That's um that's the presentation over and done with, I think. Yeah. <laughs>